Thank you, Mike. That was the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Well, normally, I don't bring a drink up here with me to the pulpit. Y'all may have been able to guess this by the fact I have this coffee. Um, either I was shamed into not bringing a, a beer, as Mike uh, Griffith said last week. That was a San Pellegrino water, by the way. But uh, Mike asked me why I was bringing a beer to church. Um, you may be able to guess by the fact I brought this coffee here this morning that your pastor is a coffee and, to an extent, a caffeine addict, particularly iced coffees, what I struggle with. And this is really kind of a recent thing for me. About five years ago, I didn't even drink coffee. I didn't like the taste of it. But, as I tell Charlotte, like you develop a taste for things over time, and I've developed a taste for coffee. Particularly the age. <laughs> what was that? Particularly as you age. Yeah, particularly as you age. Now, that coffee there is from Sweetwater's Coffee and Tea, where my friend Greg uh, Dodd, a good God-fearing Christian, owns the store. But my other big coffee money pit is Starbucks. I know what you're thinking. Oh, no. Our pastor is some kind of latte-sipping elitist liberal. He spends all the money we pay him on overpriced coffees. Maybe I should have told you all this when you're getting ready to vote on my salary for next year. Now that is only partially true because I don't drink lattes. I drink the nitro cold brew at Starbucks, which I would recommend to you, but then you might get caught in this money spending vortex that I'm currently stuck in because it's delicious. It'll get you going. But it'll also make a hole in your wallet. So, recently uh, I started going to a new Starbucks. They built one on Rosewood Drive, for those of y'all that make it to Columbia somewhat often. And it's very nice inside and still has that new store smell on the inside. And immediately next to the Starbucks is the former Rosewood Baptist Church. Unfortunately, I say former because it is now being turned into an apartment complex, an apartment building, so to speak. Now, this may be sad for obvious reasons. Number one, it's always sad when the church goes out of business, so to speak. It makes you wonder what went wrong there, particularly with such a well-placed church on a busy Columbia street with a beautiful-looking building. What happened to Rosewood Baptist Church? Clearly, it was a church that thrived at one point. So what went wrong? And number two, one thing that upsets me about this, if you've been to Columbia recently, especially the downtown area, you know that there are way too many apartment complexes being built and going up. It's almost as much of a sign as commercialization as Starbucks and worldly concerns. Now, it's not quite the same thing because it is fulfilling a need for housing, but the people that are building them aren't building them out of the goodness of their heart. They're building them to charge really high rent and try to make some money off of their investment. So this made me think of our scripture lesson today. In my Bible, the story that Mike just read for us is entitled, Jesus Clears the Temple Courts. But it might as well be titled, That One Time That Jesus Got Angry. Now, I don't know about y'all. Have you ever had a friend or a person in your life who just said, that person never gets angry? Like, I just can't picture what that person getting angry would look like. My dad had a friend uh, that I knew growing up named Bo. And Bo and Vicky, I think, were associated with, he knew him from Duke Divinity School. Um, and I, Bo was like the nicest guy ever. I can never picture him getting angry. So in this gospel story, we see Jesus getting angry. And Jesus, of all people, is not somebody that gets angry often. He's the image of peace and love. So if he gets angry, he's the guy that if you slapped him in the cheek, he'd turn the other cheek to present to you. So if he gets angry, it must be pretty significant. 
You've also heard me say that any time a story is told in all four Gospels, then it must really be significant. And sure enough, this story is told in each of John, Matthew, Mark, and Luke's Gospels. Now, you would, you especially, John adds the detail that the other three Gospel writers don't, that Jesus created a whip and started whipping people out of the temple. So that adds an extra level of anger to me. So what is Jesus so mad about here? Well, he's mad about the money changers using the temple to do their business. Simply put, you could say he's mad that there's a group of people that are doing two things that he doesn't like. Number one, they're profiting at the expense of God's name, or they're profiting off of God's name. Number two, they are presenting an obstacle or a, uh, a wall against folks worshiping. They are interfering with the sanctity of the temple. Now, it's important to look back at a little history of the time period to really understand what was going on here at the time. Money changers, as they were called, I guess you'd call it like a, an exchange. You know, if you go to Europe or something and you get your money turned into euros, you might go to a bank to do that now. The money changers were basically bankers. They were people who were necessary at, the t at that time because travelers from all over would come to Jerusalem for the Passover feast and to pay their respects to God by worshiping at the temple. Now, to do that, they often bought livestock or animals to present as sacrifices at the temple, and they also paid a temple tax. And to do that, you know, they had to convert their currency or change it over to the local currency of Jerusalem at the time. So money changers were a necessary evil, I suppose, at the time, but they should not have been operating in the temple. And that is for two reasons, and I've briefly outlined those already. Number one, they were profiting at God's expense. They were taking advantage of folks who came to worship God, who may have traveled from all over, and they were using it as an opportunity to make money. Number two, that area of the temple, the temple courtyard, was the only place that Gentiles could worship during that time period. So if you weren't Jewish, but you were coming to praise God anyway and to pay tribute to God during the Passover feast, then you had to pray in the outer temple courtyard. And it's obviously some something about praying that's a little off-putting if you have animals making noise and you know, the smell of animals out there and people, you know, basically having a market going on. If you can imagine what it would be like to have a market or a bazaar with animals inside this church right now while we're trying to worship, it's a little distracting. It would make for a, kind of a distraction when you're trying to be in a mindset to worship God. Now, in Mark's version of the story, he uses some language that John doesn't use. He says that Jesus responded to these money changers by saying, My house will be a house of prayer for all nations, but you have made it a den of robbers. Jesus is quoting two Old Testament scriptures here. He's quoting from Isaiah chapter 56 and from Jeremiah chapter 7. And basically what he's saying is the temple, like his gospel, his message of salvation, is to be used for all peoples, not just Jews. It is to be accessed and taken advantage of to be used by all ages, nations, and races. So he's saying this is a message for all nations, and yet for Gentiles you are interfering with their ability to worship. He's also basically saying that these money changers and merchants that were selling these things may not have been exactly being fair with their prices. At least that's the implication I got. If he refers to them as a den of robbers, people that are out there profiting off of something they shouldn't be profiting over. So what kind of conclusions could we draw for today? Would Jesus be mad that the Rosewood Baptist Church is now being turned into apartments? And is there anything, as Christians, 
that we should get angry about? Well, Jesus, to answer the first question, probably wouldn't be thrilled to learn the church was being made into apartments. You know, if you made it to like a, a perhaps a dormitory for uh, folks that are homeless, that would be different than making it for uh, making it to apartment building for uh, profit. But as fate would have it, I was eating lunch with a friend named Will, uh, who's a fellow dad that I see dropping off our kids. He's, his son will actually be in Charlotte's class this upcoming school year. And Will is a commercial real estate agent, and I mentioned to him Rosewood Baptist Church that I had seen it was being turned into apartments. And he said, actually, I know the guy that brokered that deal. Uh, he said he's somebody within my firm, and he put within the contract a provision that they could not tear the sanctuary down. Whoever bought it had to keep the sanctuary in place. And that's interesting because I, if you go by this place in Rosewood, you will look at it and it looks kind of odd. It's like you've got this park building here and then a sanctuary. I don't know what they're going to do with the sanctuary, but he said his friend's reasoning, his co-worker's reasoning is that he knew somebody was going to buy it. And he wanted to make sure that if it was bought, it was not torn down. But there was a reminder that this had once been a church. So while that's not ideal, I was encouraged that a Christian presumably a Christian, taking the step to preserve God's sanctuary in his own way, despite the fact that worldly forces were working against them. What about my second question? Is there anything that we should get mad about as Christians? I thought about this at our setup meeting this week because there was a lot of hand wringing and sky is falling type of talk about the state of our denomination. A lot of folks were saying, this could be our last regular setup meeting. We don't know what life will be like next year. And that's true. And I don't mean to make light of the situation. It is tragic what our church is going through. Don't get me wrong. But I've said many times from the pulpit here that God's church, God's universal church, will live on regardless of whether it has the name United Methodist outside. Zion will live on whether it has United Methodist or global Methodist, or any other title outside, we'll still be worshiping God in here, and God's universal church will live on. Now, this story we're talking about, the question I posed, what should we get angry about? Um, this story doesn't really give us a license to be angry, but it gives us a guideline of something that if Jesus took a stand on and got really agitated and upset about, Maybe it's an indication about what we should also take seriously, at least not to get angry, but to at least get passionate about and speaking out against or teaching against if it comes up. The first thing that I thought is what I've already mentioned, somebody profiting off of God's name for worldly gain. What are some examples of this? Could, this could be the so-called prosperity gospel message. You will receive riches... If you just give me a million bucks so I can buy a jet and travel over the world or buy more Starbucks, who knows? But anybody that probably asked you that, they could have good motives, but they may not. They, you really have to question and discern what are you giving your money to. So if somebody profits and becomes rich being a preacher, you might want to view that person skeptically. Or it could be a politician asking for campaign donations because of how great of a Christian he is and how much he's going to do for the church. It's possible that he could be doing great things for the church, but it could also be he just wants more money for his campaign. So you have to use discernment, and you have to look out for folks that might be trying to make money off the gospel, not for the best reasons. And the second thing, anytime someone causes another person to stumble or gets in the way of them learning about the gospel. And this could be any time you see somebody preaching a false gospel or distorting the gospel and preaching hate. The division that our church is going through is a perfect example. Regardless of however you feel about homosexual clergy and homosexual marriage, you should always keep an ear out for somebody that's saying, if they are implying that Jesus doesn't care about folks that are different from us, 
If he doesn't care about homosexuals, that is not true. Jesus didn't preach hate, and neither should we. So although you may disagree with you know, someone's lifestyle and the decisions they make, that's not a reason to shun them or otherwise love them any less. In fact, it's a reason to love them even more and to invite them into church, church to worship alongside you. So, in conclusion, I titled this uh, sermon, Having Zeal for Our Father's House. Now, we may have zeal for our Father's House, but we not may not be able to do anything about a church that we know of going out of business, you know, another church, a sister church. Unfortunately, we've seen some of that happen in the Methodist church here in Columbia recently. We may not be able to do anything about that, but we can always, we can still show zeal for our Father's house, even if it's in a small way, like my friend's co-worker did, by making sure that that building still became, remained a church, or we can do it in other ways, by keeping an ear out and paying attention to what made Jesus upset. Is someone using the gospel to profit or make money? Maybe we should speak out against that. Is somebody otherwise keeping somebody from the gospel or teaching them a false gospel? Speak out against that courageously as Christ did. And in these ways, no matter what our position is in life or what worldly power we think we may have or don't have, we can show zeal for our Father's house, have it consume us as it did Jesus Christ in this story. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.